tonight we're going to be talking about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Um, this is a, a favorite uh, chapter in the Bible of a lot of young people, um, but it's funny, you know, because the favorite verse of this of this chapter by young people is often um, only read halfway, um, and the important context is often ignored. So um, we're going to quickly, let's get some context um, before we read, and then I'll, I'll just read through this chapter, and uh, we'll cover it. So who was Timothy? So Timothy um, was a pastor, a very, very young pastor at that. Um, Paul um, knew his mother and his grandmother. He ministered to them. Um, and then Timothy got saved. And, and Timothy is referred to as being the spiritual son, the co-worker, and the brother in Christ of the Apostle Paul. They were very, very, very close. Um, I mean, very close to Ed. Um, Timothy was probably one of the closest people to Timothy. Um, and the reason young people love the letters to Timothy is because he's very young. Um, he was very young. Um, and again, that's talked about in verse 12, and we'll get to that. Um, but Timothy was a pastor. He was a pastor in Ephesus. Um, Ephesus was in Greece. And the reason he was there was because um, Paul in Acts talks about how false teaching was going to come to Ephesus. Like it was specifically prophesied, and people knew that it was coming. Um, and so Paul sends Timothy to pastor in Ephesus to make sure that this false teaching is tom stomped out uh, and that the truth alone is brought to Ephesus and the church that exists there um, because Paul had a lot of love for the Ephesians. And so Paul gives some clear instructions to Timothy that we too as young people um, and Christians in general should put into practice. So I'm going to read the chapter and then uh, we'll talk about the overall point of all of this and what the God was or what the whole, what Paul was teaching Timothy and what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. So verse one, some will depart from the faith. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the ins insincerity, insincerity of sincere. You know what? It's fine. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness. I can't read tonight. I'm sorry. I'm going to start over. Verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciousnesses are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love and faith and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things and immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Awesome. So we're going to break this down verse by verse and just talk about what Paul is really saying um, and how the context applies and, and what is being taught. So these first four vo verses are about false teaching. They're about... Um, Timothy's role in Ephesus in bringing the truth. Paul, this is not the first time that, that, that um, false teaching is brought up, um, but this is the key. This is a very important part. So let's just, let's just read those four again. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of the demons. And so, the, like I said, the, the, the coming of false teaching to the church in Ephesus was prophesied. Like they knew this was happening. This was something that Paul and the other apostles were anticipating. And it talks about how those who are false teachers were those who were ignoring the Bible, who were teaching wrongly about it, who were leading people to do things that God had not called them to do, who were deviating from the scriptures, who were changing it, altering it, um, adding more or taking away, um, and just removing the very, very important truths that Jesus Christ had made clear and that the Holy Spirit had made clear to the church in the first century um, and changing those things, reverting them, and, and, and just making them unholy. But we know in verse 5 it says, For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. 
And so Paul is telling them, this is the big command that Paul is giving to Timothy in those four verses, is to be discerning. And so discernment in the secular sense means um, to have good judgment. It means to be able to look at an array of things and know which of those are good and which are not. In the spiritual sense, it means it is a spiritual gift. And what it means is the ability to tell, to, to, dis, to make the distinction between that which is of God and that which is not. To be able to know what is coming from God and what is coming from man or from spiritual darkness, right? And so Paul is commanding him to be Timothy because to be discerning, excuse me, because Timothy is walking into a place full of false teaching, right? And so he could be totally susceptible to walking in and falling and believing the lies of the people there. But he's telling him, no, be discerning, know the truth, so that when you are there, you do not fall, you are not taught wrong, you are um, not deceived. See, Paul explains that in a time characterized by preachers with sharp teeth, and the reference there is that Jesus says that there will be teachers, there will be those who are wolves in sheep clothing, right? So he's, that's the analogy, that they are wolves. He says, when, when, when we live in a time that is characterized by preachers with sharp teeth rather than soft wool, Timothy ought to wield a sharper tool in that spiritual combat. So he's saying, in response to these wolves in sheep's clothing, we wield, right, the Ephesians 6 sword of God, which is the word, right? He says in verse 5, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. He's saying, wield these weapons. He's like, if you want to be discerning, you want to be discerning you need the word you need the strength right you need to actually be indwelled and be deep in the source of the knowledge right because and, and i'll get to this in a moment but if you're going to go there to stomp out false teaching you have to know what is true teaching so let's quickly read verse six if you put these things before the brothers meaning if you put um you know he's talking about that false teaching there, if you put before the brothers what is true and call out what is wrong, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. And so Paul is commanding Timothy in verse 6 to be unapologetic in the truth. Not that he should come up and just be mean, like be mean-spirited, but we should we call them out in gentleness, but do not apologize for what is true. Do not compromise the truth. Do not try and make the truth look better, right? Because then it's no longer truth. He's telling, he's telling him, you have to, in whatever way is gentle, in whatever way is loving and right, you have to call out what is wrong, right? You don't just let the wrong go by peacefully. You don't just let the, the, the untruthful, the defiling of the gospel exist. You actually have to stand in the way of that and preserve gospel truth. And so he says, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. He's saying, do not conform to those who fall, but serve Christ. Right? He's saying that those who fall away, that those who go on and begin to teach deceitful things, begin to teach things in insincerity, those people are not serving Christ in that action. That when people are, are preaching for their personal gain, or they're preaching for um, the gain of their church, or they're preaching because they want a spiritual experience, or they want money, or whatever, if the motive is not Jesus Christ, Paul is saying that they're not serving Christ. They're serving themselves or the world. And so he says, in order to be a servant of Christ, to teach as a servant of Christ, you have to be deep and invested in the truth. He says, and of the good doctrine, he says, being trained in the faith. So he's, he's literally saying that when you take this before the brothers, make sure that as you go before them and you correct them on this false teaching, that you are trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. That you have, in order to stand firm in the truth, you have to know the truth, right? So he's saying the only way to know the truth is to study it, right? That's the issue, is that today we have a lot of people who want to call out and make bold statements about what is true and what is not without going to the Word of God, and I'm talking about Christians, without going to the Word of God and reading what it says is true. Don't try and proclaim the truth if you have not studied the truth on your own and found the truth, right? If you're walking around and regurgitating truth that you've heard from other people, how can you know that it is true? And so Paul's saying, I've told you what is true. I've told you how to recognize and how to read the word and know the good doctrine and be faithful to the word. But he's saying, I want you to do it yourself and read it and know that I haven't lied to you. Because how do you, dis how do you make the distinction or st distinguish between the teaching of Paul and the teaching of these men? Like, how do I decide which of these is true? One might sound right and one might sound wrong, but who am I to know? And so he's saying, 
be deep in the words, be trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Like on your own, study it that I've taught you, but you need to actually search those answers your own and know the truth your own. That way, when you take it before the brothers, you know what you're doing, you know what to say, you know how to make a defense for your faith as is talked about in First Peter. I'll give you an example. So on my second account where I post uh, on theology, I made some videos about false teaching. And a lot of people were very upset because like people don't like when you tell them that their false teachers are false teachers or their favorite pastors um, are leading them wrong or whatever. Um, and that's hurtful to people. Um, and my goal was not to get on there and bash people and say, you're stupid for listening to these people or you're, or you're not discerning enough when you listen to these people or, or, you know, these people are evil and I hate them. Like, no, that's not the point. I came on there and made videos because I wanted to show people the truth, right? But my big warning to them was, I told you not to take these guys for their word. Don't take me for my word. Go and look at the Bible and compare what they're saying to what I'm saying and see which one of these things the Bible actually approves of and the Bible actually teaches, right? And so you can have pastors you look up to and you can trust them and know that it's and, and know that they've been faithful. And so for me, like when I listen to a John Piper sermon, unless I hear something that I'm like radically unfamiliar with, like I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. I get that. But if I hear something where I'm like, this is new or I don't really understand that, let me look more into what the Bible says, even though I trust John Piper, right? Because that's just one of my favorite pastors. And so what I'm telling you and urging you in is to be discerning that in order to discern the truth and view two different things and know which is good and which is not, which is of God and which is not. You have to know the things that are of God. You have to know what God says. You have to know the character of God, right? If you do not know God and know his character, you can't immediately recognize the things that he says. Like you, you can't recognize if something is of his character or not. Because anything, if a pastor teaches something, if a teacher or a preacher or an evangelist teaches something and it falls out of line with the character of God, then it's not of God. And so if you know the character of God, it will better suit you in determining what is true and what is not. So let us then have close relationships with Christ, right? So that we can know if something falls in line with the character of Jesus. But even then, don't make the assumption that you have a perfect understanding of his character, and so you can suddenly stop being dependent upon the word for those truths. Listen, Jesus says in John 17, 17, that the Bible is absolute truth, that it is ultimate truth, right? He declares it to be truth from beginning to end. And so you actually have to go through. And if you want to know the truth, it's here. And so when someone like me, when I make these videos and I call it your, 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 the, the teachers that you may like, and they very well may be false, if you haven't first gone and looked at the things they said and see if anything they say deeply contradicts the word of God, then I'm telling you, you're missing something when you come at me and get angry at me and tell me this. I'm, of course, I was expecting this and anticipating people to get upset at me um, over false teachings. But it's upsetting to me when I can recognize, because of the certain ways people describe things, that they're simply regurgitating what they've heard rather than actually citing what the Bible has to say about those things. And so I would encourage all of you to be careful what pastors you listen to, what books you read, and what to do research and know if those things align with the Bible. And first of all, the point is, as Paul is commanding him to be and dwell, to be deep in the word of God. Because if you're filling yourself with truth, when something tries to come in that's not true, that's wrong, it's like you've built up a barricade that says, wait a minute, hold on. Let's make sure that this is right to come in my to come in my cocktail party of truth. Before I just let them join everything, let's make sure this statement or, or this teaching is right. Like, does this teaching have prosperity gospel implications? If so, stay away from me. <laughs> or, or, or is this teaching deifying man and making putting man in the place of God? If so, stay away from me. Or is this teaching overemphasizing spirituality and spiritual experience over experience and knowledge, intimate knowledge of God? If so, stay away from me. That you need to be genuine and steadfast in ensuring that the things that you take in and consume are true. That's why he says at the end that if you keep on teaching this, if you keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, that you persist in this, you will save yourself and your hearers. That you will save yourself from being deceived. That if you keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. 
And so that's why I make it my personal goal because I am a teacher. I, I like to think so. Um, I like to make sure that, I mean, you guys are like my flock. It, it's less intimate, but I like to look think of you guys as my flock. Um, that when I make those videos calling out those teachers, it's not because I have some affinity or like anger towards these preachers, but simply because I want you to know the truth. But my greatest urge, my, my greatest desire is that all of you will be discerning. That you will pray to the Holy Spirit for wisdom and discernment so that you can recognize when you're being lied to when it comes to spiritual things. Because these are eternal issues. And this is just stuff that is important, you know? And so that's why Paul commands Timothy. That you need to know the truth so that when things that are lies come, you can call it out and condemn it and push it away and make sure that the people that you're leading your congregation the people around you your fellowship that they don't fall into that same lie all right verse seven have nothing to do with reverent silly myths rather train yourself for godliness this is paul commanding timothy to be wise saying don't get caught up in nonsense don't get caught up in things that don't matter I like to think of this as like the, uh, for example, I remember freshman year, I was like terrified because I'd watched a few videos on YouTube and I was convinced that Revelation's fulfillment was going to occur on September 21st, 2018, 2017. I don't know what day, uh, what year it was. I think it was 2017. I was convinced that Jesus was coming back 2017 and I was terrified. I was so worried. I was not ready for it. And I was just like, what do I do? And so I was listening to all these theories and watching all this astrology stuff. And I was just so convinced that it was going to happen. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was reading about how bad the times of revelation were going to be. And I didn't know how to handle myself. And September 21st came. And here we are. <laughs> and so I look at this verse and he says, have nothing to do with the reverent silly myths. Rather train yourself in godliness. That actually the issue is that when I look at that, that me falling for these theories and these videos, I was getting caught up with the myths, but my worry was that I was not godly. So my reaction to the fact that revelation could happen at any point, that Jesus could return at any point, with it, a date being attached, my reaction was to get more caught up in these symbols and signs and these dates rather than addressing the very reason I was anxious, which was the lack of godliness in my soul. And so I think often what we do is we look at things that give off the appearance of the, the appearance of spiritual convenience. Things are like, wow. Things that may very well be coincidences. I'm not saying that God doesn't give us symbols and signs. Um, Beautiful Eulogy has a great song and it's called Symbols and Signs with Propaganda. And it it's awesome and it explains this, but it's like this new agey, just progressive church garbage where it's we're getting caught up in things that just don't matter they don't matter so much so that they're actually getting in the way of closed-fisted issues like the divinity of jesus christ like how we are saved they're coming in between those things and being prioritized over that so paul says have nothing to do with the reverent silly myths rather train yourself for godliness the focus should not be the condition and the state of your mental capacity in regards to the spiritual things that are happening across the world. Rather, it should be the spiritual condition of your soul. That's it. That symbols and signs are cool and you can find yourself getting all caught up in it. It's like, whoa, did God create aliens? It's like, hold on, slow down. How are you doing in the process of sanctification? How close are you to Jesus Christ? Like, are you closer to figuring out where One-Eyed Willie's ship is containing the Q document and the original manuscripts <laughs> or are you closer to knowing Jesus Christ himself? You know, like what are you closer to finding? Some lost spiritual treasure or Jesus Christ who says you're found. Be wise and know the difference between irreverent silly myths and things that facilitate godliness. Verses 8 through 10. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have hope set on our living in God, by our living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. 
And so Paul's saying and ensuring Timothy that in this strive to be godly and to call out false teaching and to be discerning and wise and to be the one that is leading people and often having to tell them things they don't want to hear, it's not going to be easy. When I started posting on my second account and, and making videos about my beliefs and about theology and about false teaching and all this stuff, my backlash has multiplied by like 100%. It went from literally almost nothing to every day. I'm getting stuff from Christians who are calling me a false teacher or, or a wolf in sheep's clothing and saying that I'm a liar or that I'm judgmental and I'm judging these false teachers and I'm, it's not my place or whatever. Paul warned Timothy that this was happening. That he literally sent Timothy into a place where false teaching would come and said, be ready and endure. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. That you need to be concerned in your godliness. Right? Because the more I desire Christ, the less concerned I am with the opinions of people around me in regards to my character, right? Like I still want to be, I want to be viewed um, and respected by the congregation. I don't want, it's not my desire to have rumors about me or to do things, to actually do things that, that will nullify my work in Christ, that will cause for my credibility to be removed from me. Um, but one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 2.29. For the person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Galatians 1.10, Paul literally says, if I was trying to please man, do you think I'd still be a Christian? And so that's the whole idea is, is, is he's saying, like, you've got to be willing to spit the hard truths and to be focused on godliness. For, the, for to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hopes in the living God, who is the savior of all people. We toil and strive that we work hard. We hustle for the Lord, <laughs> that we are searching for discipline and consistency in Christ and that our hope is in him. So that in Christ, we may face the struggles of the faithful. That there are struggles that Christians will have, that this life is not promised to be easy, but as our hope is in the living God who has saved us, we will strive and toil and we will come out the other side all right. That is why he says in verse 8, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That even if you are not rewarded in this life, you will be rewarded in the next. That there is good ahead for you if you are in Christ. Romans 8.28 Verse 11, command and teach these things. That's the whole verse. Command and teach these things. A quick side part for like my guys, my ladies in here who feel called to any capacity of teaching or really in reality, it is to any spiritual gift. You know, command and teach these things. You could say like, I can't think of another example that would fall into that, that idea, but he's saying, as he said, think, think of it this way. The way he says command implies firmness. It implies that you are built upon a rock, that you are built upon a, a solid foundation. And so he's literally saying as command and teach these things, though it is simple, he's saying teach upon the rock, teach upon the strong foundation. So whether you teach or you prophesy or you, you give or you serve or you have mercy or whatever, do it upon the rock. Do it in firmness, in unwavering godliness. At least that's my takeaway. Verse 12. And this is, here it is. This is the verse that every young person loves and loves to cite. They love part A. So let me read part A real quick. Until I, oh sorry. Let no one despise you for your youth. Every young person loves that verse. They're all like, wow, man, that's amazing. That's so good. But what is God, I mean, what is Timothy? What does Paul say right after? But set the believers an example in speech and conduct in love and faith and purity. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. He's saying, oh yeah, check this out. Let no one despise you for your youth. Like, don't give them a reason to despise you. That if you are spiritually mature, if you are spiritually above your physical age, that if you are striving after godliness like that of what is characterized by a 60-year-old man in your teen years, people can't look down upon you for your youth because you are advancing spiritually. And so what's funny, 
What's funny is that we like to use this verse to tell old people in the church to not look down upon us because we're younger than them. But when we personally are called to the to the adult-like spiritual things, which let me tell you something, you as a, as a teenager right now, if you are, or a young person, adults love to say that you are the future of the church. I understand the saying. I understand that they are saying that you are the future leaders of whatever congregation you attend. But in reality, you and I, if we are Christian, we are the body of Christ presently. Right? The body of Christ presently. We are the church now. All of the church is commanded in the same standard of responsibility in the gospel. And so this is why I'm saying it's funny. It's because we say, okay, old people don't look down on me, on, upon me because of my age. But we say, but also I'm young, so don't hold me to the same spiritual standard. Well, no. No, we want to be held to a higher standard. We're saying, no, set me to that same standard. My age does not withhold me from spirituality, but we look at it and think our age is an excuse to not follow Jesus with all of our hearts. I don't care if you're 11. I don't care if you're 18. Jesus Christ says, take up your cross and crucify yourself daily. So from the moment you are saved at 13 to the moment you die at 75, you should be chasing Jesus with all your heart. 13-year-old you has no more of an excuse than 75-year-old you in running away from the Lord, in sinning and in falling into to conscious and disobedient action, into ignoring the Lord, into not chasing the Lord, that you are called to the same spiritual standard as every adult in the church, that you are called to the Great Commission, that you are called to take doctrine seriously, that you are called to take theology seriously, that you are called to take prayer and worship seriously. That you're called to be in the Word, that you're called to exercise your spiritual gifts. But the point is, if you don't want older people in the church to look down on you because of your age, don't give them a reason to. Right? Because then the whole issue with this is, as we say, well, you know, the reason I'm immature, the reason I fall short or whatever is because of my age. You don't want other people to hold you back because of your age, but then you hold yourself back. And use it as an excuse and an scapegoat. But other people can't do the same to you. Let no one despise you for your youth, including yourself, but set the believers an example in speech that you as a young Christian may very well serve as an example to adults around you. I promise you that much. And he says, believers, an example in speech and the way you speak, let it be different. Let it not be characterized by the way young people speak today. In conduct, and your in, meaning in your action, let the way you act be be con, con, be being stand in contradiction to the actions of young people today. Let your let yourself act in maturity and love, love maturely, love with your all your heart, love not. Um, you know, I think teenage love is so so characterized by like we're swooning and falling, but no, love wisely. In faith. In that, you know, you may not be pressed by the same sort of areas where you have to let go of certainty and be faithful, you know, in like income and jobs and, and all those things. But, you know, you're still a student in school and you can very, very well put your faith in Christ in that area. And so the area of your life, like all of your faith in Christ there and in purity. That especially today, young people are plagued by impurity. That some ridiculous amount of teenage guys today are addicted to pornography. And quickly, our nation is beginning to normalize sex culture, and what we're looking at is the sanctity of sexuality is removed, and our generation is being characterized by impurity. So he's saying, let your priority not be the physical, but let it be godliness. Let us not be polluted with impurity, but rather chase the Lord in godliness. I just have another really cool, awesome verse. Um, it's Jeremiah 1.7. And so this is where God is calling the prophet Jeremiah. Um, 
and this call is not easy. He's telling Jeremiah to go and tell um, the Israelites things that they don't want to hear. So, I mean, most of the prophets are killed for this reason. Um, but just listen to what he says. So he's saying before, here, I'll just read from verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all who whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Do not say I am only a youth. That if God has called you to the next Billy Graham at 14 and a half years old, then you do it. <laughs> Your age is no excuse. All right. First Timothy, uh, verse, verses 14 through 16, and then we will... We will close. So our last little part. I gotta skip back around to my Bible. Alright, verses 14 through 16. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. So last week, if you were if you were here, I talked about spiritual gifts, and this is this important. Verse fourteen: Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of leaders laid their hands on you. It's the very same idea that Paul is literally commanding Timothy, commanding him, because Timothy is a gifted speaker. He's a gifted pastor. To use that gift effectively in Ephesus, because Ephesus needed it. So what I'm telling you is that we as a body of Christ are to be complementary to one another. And no matter where you stand in Christ, no matter your age, no matter your race, no matter your your sexual your your gender, excuse me, I was going to say your sex, but no matter your gender, no matter your, sorry, no matter your age, race or gender, you are to be an effective follower of Jesus Christ, chasing godliness and not neglecting the spiritual gifts that you have been given by the Holy Spirit. And so that's the reality. You know, I know I get up here and I, I talk to young people every week. And so my point will consistently be, the reason I don't normally address you all as young people and just say that we as Christians is because I don't want you to feel demeaned by your young as a young person or that some things do not specifically apply to you because you're, you're young or because you're not old, whatever. My goal is I don't want to be addressed as somehow less valuable in Christ because of how young I am. So neither do I want you to feel that you are not spiritually taken seriously. But that also calls for you to take the spiritually seriously. That to take the spiritual seriously. That God is a calling on our lives. And if you simply lay your life in his hands, no matter who you are or where you are, if you are his child, he will use you to serve his will forever and until he returns or until he calls you home. In Jesus' name.